With Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. Hey, hey, happy Friday, everybody. You are tuned to May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media, the undisputed leader in Music Biz Talk. And I am Scott, your host, and a man who is proud to be standing tall after the rains came. You know, uh, we had a, we had a big rainstorm here in California yesterday. And true story, I'm driving on the freeway yesterday on the 405 freeway, and um, the giant freeway like like light up freeway signs, they all say um, uh, "heavy rains" to in all caps, "heavy rains today, be prepared." <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I, I find that, I find that pretty, pretty, uh, pretty amazing. I got to say that that's the, that's all the signs on the, it's like Californians are, we are scared when the sky opens up and dumps uh, H2O on us. It freaks us out at a level that cannot be described. Whereas other parts of the country are like, oh, it's just rain. Cool. No problem. No, no, no problem. But in California, that's a high, that's a highway sign, like all caps. And with me as always is my own Garth, Paul B, who got through the rain as well. How, how did it, how's the rain treating you down by Miramar Air Force Base? It cleared up now. It was kind of pouring this morning when I was driving. We we have uh, in San Diego, we have like two types of uh, rain retards. We have (laughs) people that uh, think that when it rains, you need to be going 90 miles an hour. I, I guess they're trying to there you dr- go. Dr- drive from under the cloud faster. <laughs> you think they're going <laughs> to escape it? And and on the other uh, end of the spectrum, you yeah. have people that are doing like thirty on the highway, and like, dude, dude just go. You're not you're not going to drown. <laughs> <laughs> just go. They see those signs every few feet from uh, from Caltrans that say "heavy rains today, be prepared." Well, it doesn't really explain what, what be prepared even... entails. Oh, I, I was just thinking that I was, I was I was like, "What the hell does that even mean? What what is what does be prepared like, mean? Bring, bring an I'm umbrella." On... Yeah, I'm on the freeway already. Heavy rains today. Be prepared. To me, that's like, don't be here. Make sure, make sure wherever you have to go today, cancel and take your butt home. Mm-hmm. That's Cal. That's Caltrans saying that for you. I guess. I guess be prepared means that because you're in LA, right? Yeah. Like you got some insane drivers out there. I guess the, they're warning you that their insanity is going to be amplified tenfold. <laughs> they're going to become even more erratic. Dude, that was it. Was too funny to me. I. I I, I laugh, and when the and the and the um the one of the funniest things as a as a public relations person in in all of Southern California is the news coverage of rain in Southern California right. is hysterically funny <laughs> because they go out they assign some reporter and and there are reporters out there going well it is in fact raining there are water drops falling from the sky and I'm going to go over here to this person here so uh, hey uh, um hi uh, how are you getting by in the rain today <laughs> and the person just looks at him and goes. I, I have an umbrella, you know, uh, well, there you have it, uh, you know, mild inconvenience, but people are still, uh, you know, people still just getting stuff done. Uh, it's really exciting. And and back to you. And I'm like, how in the hell is that a story? I mean, how is that a story? It's uh, I, I'm sorry that that and when I first moved here, uh, I, I was laughing out loud when I moved here from St. Louis and I moved to Los Angeles and I first saw that kind of coverage. I was, I, I, it, it, it stunned me beyond anything I, I can begin to tell you. I just said, how in the world is this any kind of a story or any kind of a big deal at all? You know? And, uh, but it is, it is when it, when it rains, boy, California, that's a big, it's a big deal to us. So anyway, that's what's, uh, that's what's going on today. Hey, you are tuned in to may the best brand win. You are lucky because you're here at episode 82, uh, all the rest of the episodes were crap before this one. This is the one right here. This is the one that breaks through. No, I'm just kidding. This is the one that's going to be the breakthrough, though. I can, I can feel it. Um, a little bit about me, just so you know. Um, I got an email uh, this week from somebody that says, uh, you never say who you are or, or you know why we should care and that kind of thing. I'm like, yeah, but you can Google me and stuff. I mean, you know, and I run a company. So anyway, that's... um. Here's here's what about me. I have about 30 years experience doing uh, marketing and communications. I run my own company called Robertson Com for um uh different brands, um music and entertainment companies, um 
you know, nonprofits, you know, really anybody that um, I, I solve business problems through um, strategic public relations, marketing, communication stuff. That's what I've done my entire career. Uh, I do it at my company now. If you ever want to reach me, like some people do, uh, you can always email me at scott at robertsoncom.com. That's my email. Uh, or uh, you can visit our website at uh, uh, robertsoncom.com or any of our social handles. Twitter, it's at robertsoncom. Uh, on Periscope, we're live on Periscope right now. And um, that is also at robertsoncom. And um, Facebook is, no surprise, facebook.com slash robertsoncom. And um, uh, LinkedIn, robertsoncom, you know. You, you can find it. We're out there. What can I tell you? And ladies, uh, if you are like pina coladas and getting caught in the rain. Uh, there you go. <laughs> if you like pina coladas and listening to an hour-long show about marketing and PR, <laughs> then you're in the right place. <laughs> you're in the right place, baby. So today we're talking about, um, I call this episode Shining or Shrinking in the Media Spotlight because... Um, this is a problem that um, communications people uh, will face or do face and that kind of thing. And, but not everybody kind of knows about it. Um, really making audiences aware of what companies are doing is what marketing does, right? Um, that's what we do. But sometimes the company leaders are uncomfortable with um, the bright, shining spotlights of media coverage and having that elevated profile. So in today's um, award-winning episode of the show, we're going to talk about the media spotlight. We're going to talk about what to do to prepare for it. And we're going to talk about how to shine in those moments. And um, since a lot, um, I know a lot of my uh, listeners are um, marketing communications people themselves. We're going to talk about, you know, what do you do when you run into a situation like this? What do you do when you, when you run into uh, you know, a, a company that, that wants, um, you know, that, that, that wants this kind of profile, but uh, maybe the senior leadership's a little bit shy. And we're also going to uh, shine a little bit of truth of our own on who's winning and losing this week. We are going to talk about Facebook and the uh, and the apology and the whole and the whole scandal. I'm um, going to spend some time talking about Facebook because I think it's fascinating uh, from a marketing communication standpoint, um, and just from a um, you know this is a, a huge force in our world kind of standpoint. Um, so let's talk about it. So the media spotlight. So the irony of this situation, which is probably not lost on some of you is the fact that, you know, companies call on us, you know, uh, communications companies, Hey, make us different, you know, make us, um, stand out, you know, make us, uh, you, you know, all, all these different things, elevate our profile, put shine the, you know, make sure that you can shine the spotlight right on us. And then every once in a while, you'll have a client that says, Oh, but I don't want to do any interviews. You know, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to do any interviews. I, I, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. And then, you know, you're you're in quite a pickle right there because now you have a situation where what they've hired you to do, they don't actually want you to do. It's actually the equivalent of like hiring a roofing company and they say, I'd like you to fix my roof. I'd like you to I'd like you to fix my roof. But, uh, you know, um, don't make any noise doing it. You know, uh, you guys you have to be completely quiet. Uh, you know, I can't that, you know, there's you know, they put a limitation on you that that negates your ability to do the work. Um, which then, you know, as a service provider, you always want to say, you always want to help the client. But when you get into, caught in a position like that, um, it can be really tricky because you're like, you, you need to have the conversation that kind of goes like this. You, you need to have the conversation that goes like this. You hired me to elevate your profile. Is that not what you want? What, what are we, what are we doing here? If you're not, if you're not comfortable with this and, and that's a good conversation to have earlier rather than later. It's definitely a, it's a it's a really good conversation to have before you've uh, you know set up a lot of media interviews and done a lot of things to bring the light of day onto a company. Um, you you'd always want to know that you know beforehand as opposed to later. Um, I think the answer to solving it, you need to understand why it happens. So let's just put our CEO hats on for for a few minutes and think about why. So some CEOs have the blessing of the press, you know, uh, following their career and following what they're doing in a positive way. And, um, you know, uh, that can be great when that happens. But eventually there's going to be a negative story. 
there's going to be a negative story or two. There's going to be a negative experience or two. There's going to be, um, you know, baggage in that CEO's um, past about a reporter that, you know, got some facts wrong. They got something, you know, really twisted around or they really, you know, in a vindictive way, really went after the company and tried to do some do some harm. You know, I mean, believe me that, you know, there there are journalists out there who, you know, seek to do damage there there absolutely are so um you you have to know that or or and and it's it's actually inaccurate to say they seek to do damage it's, it's that they seek something else they're seeking the sensationalism of journalism of, of of the coverage and the audience that that brings in and those kind of things over you know telling whatever kind of story um or if that is the story that they want to tell that kind of thing so anywho so uh, you know, you know how I always talk about empathy. You know, it's really missing from communication communications. Well, in solving this problem, you can solve it by using your empathy. Use your empathy for the CEO. Put yourself in their position and understand where the the fear is coming from. And make no mistake that it is fear. It is fear of the situation going wrong. If you have a public company, it's a situation of there being a shareholder reaction that's negative. Um, it's a it's a fear that goes all the way down to I'm going to look bad in front of the shareholders. I'm going to look bad in front of the board. I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose this job. You know. I'm, you know. There's there's a lot. You know. CEOs. Um, th- there's a lot to being a CEO. You know. You got to re- report to a, a lot of people, and and you know. Uh, it's a it's a high pressure job. You know. It's a it, for for uh, you know for a lot of people. So. When you kind of come in with this communications, you know, piece to it, and obviously you need the CEO sometimes to tell a, a story about the, you know, about the company. You need, you know, you need one of the founders at least, and, and usually the CEO to tell that story. Then, you know, you're an additional thing that could go wrong, that could become a huge, huge problem for this for the CEO and for this company. So, again. Let's put our empathy on and let's understand, you know, what, you know, what is behind the behavior. And in almost every case, there's story time. So if you can sit down with the CEO and you can get to story time, you're going to be in a good place. The story time is when they start telling you what they're afraid of. I did an interview with 60 Minutes once and I was a laughing stock of the century and they made fun of my company and 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 you believe me there's you know there's a harms case at the end of at the end of story time always and so you have to listen and you have to understand that and then you have to be you have to be in reassurance mode which is okay i get that i get that you know that you can be uh, you know afraid of the media spotlight and i understand that however you know we we have a job to do here you know uh, i i and, and the job requires um, a front person, you know, the, the band needs a lead singer to come out and welcome the crowd. And if the band's lead singer is shy, then you better damn well have the lead guitarist, you know, up their skills and be able to do it. You know, um, it's like, you know, if, uh, can't believe I'm going to say this sentence, but like, if just for the example, example, if, if David Lee Roth were shy, and of course there is no known earth where that is true, but let's say that was true, then you would need Eddie to come out and be the front person for the band. You know, you need somebody else to do it because, you know, somebody, somebody's got to do the job, you know? And, and that's the really frank and, and honest conversation that you, that you need to have, you know, in, in that situation. If you have a CEO that says, I really just don't want to, you know, sometimes it comes from a, a, a position of like, you know, maybe it doesn't come from fear. It just comes from just incredible humbleness, you know? Oh, it's really not me. It's really the team. It's really all those kind of things. Great. Well, then who's going to be our spokesperson? You know, who do we have that can tell this story and that can be the face, you know, that the the press are going to need? And who do we have that are going to deliver our messages? You know, because uh, it can be a spokesperson for, uh, you know, it can be like an anonymous spokesperson from the PR department for a time, but it can't be forever. If you want, I mean, you know, if you want to shine the light of day on a company, the press are going to start to have questions about, well, who's pulling the strings on this thing? Who's got the vision? You know, where... Where is this coming from? Where's the, you know, and, and, and almost nobody can really deliver the vision other than the person who, you know, has the vision and is responsible for the vision. Uh, you know, you knew the job was dangerous when you took it. That's what I say. So, you know, 
But here's what you do when it happens. Again, empathy. Another thing is, you know, as a as a counselor to um, you know, to senior executives, I always kind of think of us as a doctor, a, do- a doctor patient relationship. You know, a doctor's job is to diagnose what's going on, to figure out the problem and to recommend solutions. It's the patient's job to agree and, you know, and provide consent and be a good patient and those kind of things. But the doctor can't get pissed at you if you, you you know, the doctor doesn't get upset with you if you don't take their recommendation, if you go to another doctor, that kind of thing, right? The doctor just is like, okay, great. You need a second opinion? Groovy. Fine. I did my job. That kind of thing. It's really important. Sometimes we get personally involved in, in things. Uh, I've seen it happen a lot on my marketing teams throughout the years and we can get really, you know, we can make things really personal, you know, Oh, they didn't like that design. Well, screw that. You know, know, that kind of thing. No, you're the doctor. Your job is to prescribe. Your job is to diagnose, prescribe, create the solution, you know, you know, create the solution to get them to wellness. But if they don't get the surgery, if they don't, you know, if they don't take another course of treatment, then that's not on you at that point. That's on them. And you need to have that. It is important to have that little transference of responsibility conversation. If they decide to go their way, then they're responsible for what happens next. And that's, uh, you know, uh, that's an important thing to do too. So my last point is, you know, when, when um, a senior leader is, is kind of shunning the spotlight, you can still make the company shine by A, yeah, obviously, you can find another spokesperson that can that can do this. Uh, B, you can find some other ways to get that senior leader involved. Maybe it's a canned video, you know. Maybe it's a, a you know a canned video. Maybe they're doing um, already doing a presentation to you know the shareholders or the board or something, you know, via video. And you could also kind of use that in some kind of a way to um, you know as a, a uh, as a statement. Uh, Sometimes it's a post, you know, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg did a post to all the Facebook uh, users, you know, basically apologizing for their role in the in the, um, in the scandal, which we're certainly going to talk about a bit in the next segment in winning and losing. But there are ways that you can help the company shine, you know, even when the leader is uh, shining the spotlight. And, you know, the spotlight can be bright, you know, but it's our job to help people get it, understand it, figure it out. And right now, you are tuned to May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media, the undisputed leader in music biz talk. Come on back. We're going to talk about who's winning and losing this week in marketing communications, including, yes, Facebook. We'll see you in a few. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al Dimiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Make this your vinyl night. I'm John J.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. 
Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on entertalkradio.com. May the best brand win with Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. Hey, hey, it's Friday, everybody, and you are so smart because you're back with May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media, the undisputed leader in Music Biz Talk. We are talking about the spotlight today and the spotlight of media engagement today. Paul's with us in the booth. Paul's hanging out. I got my sunglasses on for any unwanted media attention. Any unwanted media attention. I don't like spotlights. (laughs) They blind me. (laughs) We do run into it from time to time. It's one of those weird conversations where you're like, um, hey, the New York Times wants to uh, wants to uh, do a story on on you. And sometimes the CEO will be like, "Uh, we'll cancel it. I don't want to do it. (laughs) It's got to be scary. And you're like, I'm sorry. Could you could you speak into my good ear? You're gonna you're you're gonna need to say that again for me. Uh, I said cancel it. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, okay. All right, no problem. A lot of fun. Well, cool. Well, let's get right into winning and losing because man, we have a whole bunch going down this week. Um, you know, let's start off with Uber. Um, so, uh, Uber self driving car, one of Uber's lovely self driving cars has um, uh, struck and killed a pedestrian in metropolitan Phoenix this past week. Company officials say Uber is now halting all of its self-driving uh, testing as of Monday as the investigation has con- is continuing. So um, 30 states right now um, say that self-driving cars are okay. Uh, more than 30 states have passed measures to accommodate these robotic cars. In at least five, autonomous cars are already roaming the roads. Um, so losing, I mean, clearly, uh, you know, here, here's the thing. Machines break, right? Uh, as great as they are, your cell phone locks up, you know, your, your Ziosk kiosk at the, uh, you know, at Chili's when you're trying to pay, uh, freezes up, uh, your, your, your car, you know, seizes up, things happen. And, um, this is the question that we're going to have to become get really clear on is, you know, when this continues, you know, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. You know, self-driving cars are going to be involved in accidents and they are going to kill people. Uh, what level of acceptable risk are these companies going to, you know, take on this? You know, how, how what does this liability, you know, picture sort of look at? You know, uh, and how do you how do you quantify it in order to make people feel safe around these vehicles? To me, um, you know, I I see a huge potential for these vehicles being hacked uh, and becoming extremely dangerous. I mean, you're talking about an automobile that, you know, can move, you know, speeds up to, you know, 140, 150 miles an hour with a full tank of uh, gasoline or whatever. And um, and and be a really dangerous projectile in the wrong hands and the wrong hands might have a phone that has hacked the uh, self-driving you know piece in the car. So it's like to me, there, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff on the dark side of this that they haven't addressed yet properly. And they haven't, they they really haven't talked about yet, but I think it will be interesting to see how this plays out. Right. Because now that um, it's happened, now that a self-driving car has taken a human life and the machine machines are like, yeah, that's one sweet, you know, you know, Skynet's like Skynet one, you know, humans, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, now that that's happened, it'll be interesting to see what the response is. And it'll be interesting to see what public opinion will do to this. You know, um, you know, trucking companies are looking to re- replace truck drivers and get more autonomous trucks on the road. Well, if one of those gets hacked or, or just breaks down and goes the wrong way and, co- and keeps going, you know, through a red light and kills multiple people, I mean, you know, 
trucks are are big and can cause a lot of damage. Um, what does that look like? You know, and 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 that kind of thing. And people are like, well, they're probably more reliable than human drivers and this kind of thing. Yeah, but there is something about us as people that fundamentally doesn't trust machines with that much autonomy, right? And I think that, um, you know, uh, I think it's justified, to be honest. And I think that, you know, Uber's already um, halting all of its self-driving testing. And, um, and you know, as they kind of look look into these uh, solutions further, look into what happened and look at what, what they can do. But um, I think the response will be interesting in the in the coming years. So we're going to put self-driving cars in the losing category and Uber in the losing category for the last few weeks, I guess, with a lot of stuff going on with them. So anyway, there you have it. Let's talk about Facebook. Ma'am, so uh, for those of you that don't know, um, there is quite a... Uh, there's quite a lot of interesting stuff happening around Facebook. First of all, um, there is a, a company, Cambridge Analytica, that apparently has illicit, illicitly pulled uh, a lot of user data from the platform and, um, you know, uh, used it for some, you know, purposes, some political, you know, purposes uh, related to the Trump campaign, Right. Um, a couple of interesting things that uh, around around that I think first of all um, a lot of people have come forward and said that Facebook has been doing this for years that says that Facebook um, as you know uh, for, for both Obama campaigns um, the, oh, oh, there were sto- there were all these stories about how Obama brilliantly used um, user data from Facebook brilliantly you know, used it and and uh, mastered social media you know in such a way that that was able to you know win the election and you know with the young people and all this BS you know and, and all that kind of stuff and and you know here's here's the here's the fairness part that comes into this if it's brilliant when one candidate does it of one party then it should be equally brilliant when another candidate does it. It cannot be. It's brilliant when this candidate does it, and now it's a scandal when another when another person does it. That is crap. That can that cannot stand. That you know because now we're just making stuff up because we don't like a particular candidate. You know who, who happens to be president, or or whatever else, and that's not cool. You know, if it's a crime, you know, if it's a crime or it's a scandal or it's a bad thing, then it's a bad thing when everybody does it. And again, if you've already pr- passed a verdict in the press that um, there is a that it was it was good the first time around, then in my opinion, it's good all around. You know, the other thing, the thing I'll say about Facebook is it's become quite a nasty little thing for Facebook um, because uh, they've known about it for years, two years and four months to be exact. Um about about this uh, mark zuckerberg made a statement this week about it and he um basically said you know that he was um you know a very apologetic type of statement you know he basically uh, offered up you know solutions that you know one might look at it like a data breach kind of thing you know assurances about it here's what we're gonna do here's some small technical fixes here's what we're gonna do procedure wise this kind of stuff we're gonna investigate all apps that have pulled in large amount of its data and ban those who have found to be used mistake you misuse data you know and and the company will inform people whose data has been misused now now here, here's why and, and this will be different than most people and I understand they say oh Facebook was duped Facebook was duped Mark Zuckerberg is a software programmer he designed Facebook, you know, as a CEO, he didn't come in and go, well, I just let the kids, you know, fool around and I just go out and talk. No bull crap. You built it. You know, you built Facebook, you know, exactly what the code's doing. And, and from what I know about him, I, you know, I certainly don't know him personally, but what I know about him, he's pretty on top of things. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, how the servers are set up, very deep technical information is passed on to him, you know, about the inner workings of his company, not stuff like how much money have we raised and, and, and all that kind of stuff. He's not interested in that. He is a software programmer. He's a coder who didn't see the movie. Everybody see the movie, right? Did you see a great financial genius sitting in front of the thing? You saw a dude doing what? writing code, right? Coder, software programmer. So 
I find it completely non-believable, unbelievable, the fact that Mark Zuckerberg says he didn't know that we were being duped. It's like, you knew. You, you knew because you know code and, you know, and I just doubt the fact that these guys are smarter than Zuckerberg when it comes to putting in this code. They did not dupe this guy about how this, how this data was coming in there. No way. No way they did because he, like I said, he knows every line of code on the stupid thing, you know? So I just, uh, I just don't buy that. I don't buy that at all. And I, and I think that, you know, anybody that thinks about it for about five seconds, you know, realizes that. You know, he knew they were being paid. They were okay. And they were certainly, they were, they were fine and dandy with it when Obama was using it. You know, I mean, really the, the, the political, you know, motivations really start to come, come out. Um, there was another article that came out that said that, um, the F- Facebook knew about another Obama's consulting firm, you, you know, doing the same kind of thing. And then they came over to their office and, um, and congratulated them, you know, after Obama won the, uh, won the election and, 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 you know, ca- you know, congr- Facebook congratulated them and said, Hey, we knew you were doing this stuff, but, but you were, we were on your side. So that's kind of thing. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, you have, you have to determine, you know, uh, what's a crime and what's not again, I think, you know, and, and certainly politics plays a, a big role in this kind of thing. But I encourage you, if you haven't seen it, to check out Zuckerberg's interview. Um, I think it's less than honest. But the residual impact of what's going on with that is um, today, March 23rd, is Delete Facebook Day. And Elon Musk, after being questioned on Twitter, has now deleted the Facebook pages for Tesla and Space uh, SpaceX, to uh, you know, two of the companies he runs. And basically... Um, you know, it was it was pretty funny. Musk basically said, um, uh, they, they said, are you going to delete Facebook, you know, your Facebook things? And then Elon Musk said, oh, it's the first time I've seen either of these pages. One on the left looks official. We'll be gone soon. So, you know, Musk didn't even know that he had Facebook pages set up, but apparently they're gone now. And apparently the in vogue thing now is to delete Facebook and delete it out of your life and look at all the ways they're using data. And, um, you know, and here's what I got to say to the people out there. You know, f- Facebook you, you know, is very, to me, they're very transparent about the fact that we, that they're like, hey, us in San Jose, we own Facebook. If you upload photos to us, they're ours. If you upload music to us, it's ours. If you build a huge following of people to looking at your content, it's still ours. Everything is ours. You know, we own this. You don't own Jack. You know, and that's why I tell companies, I say, they say, oh, we've got, we're building a big presence on Facebook. I'm like, are you? You know. Are, are, are you building traffic for Mark Zuckerberg? You know, I mean, are, are you building a big, a big following on his land? Let me know how that works out. You know, um, it's not going to work out is how that works out. And um, don't is another good message there. But apparently the in vogue thing and what you're seeing now is, is sort of a, um, uh, a lot of people saying, well, if they're going to if they're misusing our data, then we should delete them. Everybody misuses your data. Allow me to allow me to drop the truth right on top of you, okay? Everybody's got your data, okay? And they're selling it. And they're selling it right and left. And if you don't think so, then you are naive beyond words. And you need to come back to earth where we're all standing here and realize that if you're getting something for free, you are the product that they're selling, Okay. Very important to understand that. And if you understand that and you and you still go into the, you know, you know, uh, you know, if, if you know the 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 strangers got candy and you still go in the van, that's on you. You know, that's what I'm saying. So anyway, keep it in mind. Facebook's losing all over the place. And I know I have enough time to go. I could do a whole episode on on how what's going on there, and I'm sure we'll keep talking about it. But hey, I want to talk about who's winning this week, and that might be the um, the CEO behind the Bratz dolls and the little tykes toys wants to save Toys R Us. Um, Isaac Larian uh, says that he and two other identified unidentified investors are now pledging uh, 200 million dollars to save some of uh, 400 of the remaining 735 U.S. stores that are slated to close. He started a GoFundMe page. He's doing you know uh, he's basically on a mission to save Toys R Us. Which is interesting because, you know, 
Um, obviously, he did a lot of business with Toys R Us, uh, you know, with the Brat, Brat Styles, the little tyke toys, probably still does business with that. But interesting that he's trying to raise enough money to buy the company and sort of revive the brand. That That is um, is kind of a fascinating thing. And it might be kind of a, a last chance, a last ditch effort for Toys R Us to not completely close and kind of keep the brand in our uh, in our consciousness. So we're going to put that in winning, I would say. Um, you know. Uh, Gibson continues to be uh, in the, on the losing side of things, but uh, uh, Henry Jeskowitz, uh, Gibson CEO, gave another um, interview this week uh, to the Los Angeles Times um, talking about uh, how his dream was to be the Nike of music lifestyle, and now he has to cut back his ambition, um, yada, yada, and um, there are lots of rumors that investors want Jeskowitz out while um, you know there's a reminder that there's $560 million of debt that's due in the summer. Um, and they're still figuring out a way to, to do that. Um, the article um, also features a lot of really damning quotes from retailers, including Nashville based Groon guitars, George Groon, who say, who uh, states in the article, um, you have to eat so much garbage in order to be a Gibson dealer that it's just not worth it. And, um, you know, certainly uh, I've, I've heard that for years as well from a lot of dealers. They said that, you know, it's, um, you know, uh, uh, it's hard to be a Gibson dealer because um, of some of their terms and those kind of things. And that kind of stuff always tends to come and bite you in the butt at the, at the um, worst possible times. Like for example, when you're trying to keep, you know, all of your dealers happy and everything. And when, you know, when everybody can sense blood in the water for this $560 million, I don't think anybody in the music industry wants to see Gibson go down. Um, but there's plenty of people who want to see Henry go down. I mean, believe me, he's got uh, a list of enemies that uh, uh, is is quite long, to be honest. And, um, you know, un- unfortunately for him, a lot of those people are uh, going to be uh, looking for that blood in the water here uh, in the coming months. You know, last thing I want to say, winning, is uh, Black Panther has broken yet another record and made Twitter history this week. Um, so basically, um, the... The new, the latest feather in the cap of of Black Panther is the fact that it has inspired more than thirty five million tweets, and now Black Panther has been the most tweeted about movie of all time. So congratulations to uh, Black Panther, and they have such hashtags as you know, hashtag what Black Panther means to me. I thought it was a good movie. Um, you know, the worldwide gross one point one billion. You know, I think the budget was only in the 300 millions. So you've got ROI there, you know, on the movie. And um, I thought the movie was great. Um, I think that kind of what people made, the, the the racial side of it was a little bit overblown. It was just a great movie on its own. It had great acting, great, you know, great action, uh, all those kind of things. And deserves to stand on its own two feet because of that. And you are standing on your own two feet because you're listening to Made the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media, the undisputed leader in music biz talk. Come on back. I'm going to try to give you some tips for dealing with that bright, bright media spotlight. See you in a few. Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have have the gear to get you into the game from leading manufacturers like mesa boogie fender pioneer and american audio to sound your best you need the best pitbull audio can deliver in rehearsal on stage and into the big time dropping beats shredding guitar or making the crowd roar whatever you dream pitbull audio can help make it happen we are pitbull audio we want you to play it loud pitbullaudio.com make this your vinyl night i'm john jr robinson and every week music creation comes alive through stories experiences and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds my friends and i share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as michael jackson eric clapton quincy jones and steve winwood to name a few Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on entertalkradio.com. 
This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? May the best brand win with Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. Hey, hey, everybody. It's Friday, and you are so wise because you are tuned to May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media. Thank you. The Undisputed Leader in Music Biz Talk. I am Scott, your host. You're in segment three. We just finished doing segment two, winning and losing. I got Paul B. with me. We're talking. What did you uh, like from the collection of funness uh, this week? Well, I, I think I saw the the self-driving Uber thing on a Facebook post that you did, and I wasn't sure if it was just like an Uber in one of those cars that, that you could set to auto driver, or is this completely autonomous, just robot car? Robot car. Oh, man. Who, like, who, who's, who like said that's okay? Like what? <laughs> I know. I, I blame me. I, you know, things break down, man. It's like, and and when it does break down, do you really want? Do you really want to be dealing with the fact that you have a uh, this big vehicle that can could you know wreck a lot of havoc out there on its own? It's it's obviously too Gotta soon. Say. It's cle- it's clearly too soon to have these things out on um, on the road just willy nilly and and yes. like I mean I, you, this this was where this was in Nevada. Or, uh, or Phoenix. Phoenix, Phoenix, Metropolitan but, like, Phoenix. Was it like did the state pass? Like did they vote on this? And like people just decided this is okay. Like it, it seems like one of those des- decisions that's made for you that you don't have any say in. Yeah, you know, I think it it's public opinion, right? Public. Uh, everybody wants to be seen as a progressive state. Oh, California's doing it, so we should do it. Oh, well, they're doing it, so we should do it. And nobody's asking the question of going. Okay, so uh, have people tested this crap? Right. You know, I, I mean, and, and what is the contingency when these things go wrong? Um, you know, because, you know, there's there's not a lot of, you know, uh, I think it's a public opinion thing. I think a lot of state governments, mm-hmm. you know, passed a lot of legislation without thinking it through because they don't, they rarely think anything through. And it's like you were saying, like some of yeah. these things you could see yeah. coming a mile ahead, like these are going to be hacked. These are going to be used as weapons. Oh, yes. There's going to be crazy, you know, political, you know, uh, fiascos about it. Let's ban all cars because cars kill people. And it's it's going to be, yeah. it's going to be nutty. You want to see, uh, you want to see a scene of that? If Remember the last Fast and the Furious where they, um, they hijack uh, one of the, the biggest action scenes they have in the movie, the last Fa- Fast and the Furious 8, they hack a bunch of cars in Manhattan and use them as weapons to knock down this political person's, um, mm-hmm. you, you know, um, uh, convoy. That's coming. You know, exactly. And so you're like, you know, it's not even like an original idea. It's like, you know, movies have already covered it. So obviously it, you know, there's at least, you know, some potential that it could happen, you know. I would say, you know, there's, I mean, I, I, I think they need to put a big, put the brakes on that in a big way and really test that. And, yeah. and really, and really, especially the, the trucking part really scares me too, because trucks are dangerous enough on the roads. They're so big. They can do so much damage right. so quickly. And, you know, uh, and, and then you, you, know, you add yeah. into the equation, uh, the kind of natural disaster, like, uh, like drizzle that we get in California. <laughs> <laughs> throw a little rain at it actually during drizzle computers are probably like no problem you know computers are like hey it's just raining Mm. computers are laughing to themselves going hey do you see the sign it says heavy rains today (laughs) that's hysterical (laughs) (laughs) these humans these humans are so stupid it it says be prepared wait let let me do uh an a system update right now i gotta be prepared let's uh, yeah let's update the system well that's uh self-driving cars is going to be a We'll be talking about that a lot on this show. I have a feeling as more and more people make mistakes and figure out how to communicate about it and, and really public opinion is what you want to watch on that. Though my, my guess is it's probably going to be one of those things that uh, it's going to look horrific when it happens. But if you analyze it statistically, it might be safer than just, you know, drunk drivers and 
You know, there's probably there was probably like a ton more like horse accidents back when you know horses would kick people and throw people and carry exactly. would r- run over it. Cars are probably safer <laughs> overall than horses. But you, yeah, you, maybe you just have to look at the statistics and like the occasional truck plowing in into a crowd of pedestrians. Maybe statistically still better off. Who knows? It's yeah, a that weird is, future yeah. we're headed for. It's weird. It's and that's definitely true. I think you know they'll they'll have to. Um, it's just the um, it's just the fact that every time one of these self driving cars kills somebody, it's going to be a huge headline that's picked up hundreds of times. Yeah. Every every time a human driven car kills somebody, it that's fades. It, 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 it doesn't it doesn't happen. But when a self driving one does it, you better believe you're going to hear about it everywhere in the world. And I just wonder what our propensity is to, to deal with that news, you know, and and that kind of thing. And you know, people will be. You know, there'll be some, there'll be groups standing up and going, what about the children? And, you know, and, and, and that's, that's all we need right there is, and then, then public opinion starts to uh, kind of shape them. You know, I should do a show. We should do, I should do a show on public opinion and just talk about, um, you know, uh, cause it is, sometimes it becomes an objective of marketing communications and PR to, uh, you know, play a role in trying to, you know, uh, change public opinion in various areas. And it is kind of a fascinating uh, field of study. Mm-hmm. Well, we are here on episode 82. We've been talking about the media spotlight for the whole show. Uh, spent a lot of time on Facebook in the last segment. Um, now we're, uh, I like to, in segment three, I like to make it a little bit more educational, And I like to give you a few uh, tips. Uh, so these are going to be tips for dealing with um, the spotlight well. Helping uh, organizations where you're, you know, called upon to counsel and and making sure that you are helping people deal with the media spotlight well, particularly in those areas. You know, like I said, a lot of this problem comes from that that irony that uh, a company, you know, hires a, you know a PR firm or a PR consultant to come in and hey, make us famous, that kind of thing. And sometimes the senior leadership doesn't really want that. They they don't really want to personally do that or they're uncomfortable with how they look on video or they don't like the way their voice sounds or they, you know, are self-conscious from some other area. I mean, there's, believe me, the, I've, I've heard them all. I've heard them all. And there's, uh, you know, they all come from the same place, which is I don't want to do this because I had a bad experience once. And I don't want to tell you the story because it's locked away in a box down inside my brain somewhere. And I don't tell people that story. Uh, but again, if we use our empathy, sometimes we can get to that story and we can kind of figure out what the root cause is. So anywho, here's the tips. Uh, number one, you know, to me, it all comes down to setting the right expectations from the start. Um, you know, um, and that often includes having a conversation that goes like this. Okay. You've hired Robertson com to help, uh, you know, publicize what you're doing in your company. Occasionally we, you know, have a need or the the press have a need to tell the story behind the company. And when that happens, we need the CEO. So you CEO, uh, you know, how comfortable are you with those type of requests? It's great to get that stuff out in the open in like your initial planning meetings and those kind of stuff. Cause what you don't want is you move forward, you book, um, um, you know, an interview with the New York times And now your CEO doesn't want to do it and wants you to cancel. Now you got a problem. You got stress because now you got a reporter, you know, now you got your personal marketing communications PR relationship with this reporter on the line, um, you know, and you're going to feel really personal about it and those kind of things. And it's just, it, it shouldn't get to that point. It shouldn't get to that point. If the expectations are set correctly from the start, you want to unearth any of these kind of spotlight shunning tendencies. Um, you know, I had um, I had a client once um, in the tech space back in the in the nineties um, who believed in uh, space aliens. You know, uh, and, and I may have told a little bit of this story before, but but um, the the client uh, was very uh, you know upfront about the fact that that he believed in aliens he believed in alien life he believed that a planet had been visited you know he had some he had some pretty kind of out there beliefs especially for a ceo of a large technology company um you know and that's fine you know no problem with that so um you know when we're having that expectation setting conversation we sat down with the ceo and we're able to say okay um in order to make 
this, you know, you know, you, you know, to do our job that you've hired us for this company, we're, we're going to need you to, you know, deliver, d- to help deliver these messages about vision and those kind of things. And we're also going to need you to maybe not deliver the messages, you know, about aliens. You know, it's going to be really important that that doesn't come out, you know, because if it does, it's going to sort of be counterproductive for the work that you've hired us to do. Right. But I use that as an example because, um, you know, uh, and it sounds like it's kind of funny and, and all those kind of things, but it's a very, it's a very real thing when you're hired to do a job for the company and you need a spokesperson to do it. And you realize that they could be a ticking time bomb and, um, you know, there, there's published works out there with their name on it that say, you know, the earth has been visited by space aliens and, you know, that, that kind of thing. You, you realize that that's some, you know, some low hanging fruit for, uh, you know, uh, an opportunistic journalist and those kind of things. So, um, again, but it all comes down to tip number one, you know, you are setting the right expectations. You're having a very open and honest conversation about what the process looks like and about what you need as a practitioner. Even if you're, if you're an internal person, let's say you're the, you know, you're hired to be, you're the director of PR. You need to have that conversation with the CEO and say, in order for me to do my job here at the company, the job that is in my job description, I need you. I need you to be able to do X, Y, and Z and those kind of things. And then if the CEO says, oh, I don't like the way I look on video. Oh, I look fat. I look all these kind of things. Oh, you don't look fat. You know, you're just big bone. You know, yada, yada, yada. You know, I mean, believe me, I've been in a lot of conversations like that. Um, the CEO is a human being. You know, I mean, they, they have insecurities. They have, again, it, it always comes down to, you know, one or more uh, nasty little stories that have set them on this path. You know, people don't um, behave for no reason is something I always say. And so if you can find out why they're behaving, um, you're going to be light years ahead of just trying to kind of, uh, you're going to be light years ahead of understanding where it's coming from. Really important. So anyway, Set those expectations that's going to come out. Number two, um, do your job to make sure that all of your senior execs are very well prepared for any media ops. Um, I see this get violated all the time. Um, they say, oh, well, we got an interview you know, with, with this and well, we're just going to use our standard talking points. No, every major interview you need to go over uh, you know, together. You need to make sure that you've practiced, that everybody feels well prepared, that everybody knows what they're going to wear, that everybody knows where they're supposed to show up. They know what kind of what the phone is going to be. And this is your job as a, you know, if you're in charge of communications, then all of these details fall to you. You don't, uh, you know, you don't fall into the trap where they say, oh, I'll just call them, you know, when I get a chance, you know, and, and I'll just call them and we'll, and we'll just act like, you know, it's a Sunday barbecue. It's not. This, you know, always, I always think in the back of my mind, I'm like, this interview has the, has the potential to move us forward or it has the potential to destroy the company. You know, every single time that we do this, we have the potential to destroy the company every single time that we open our mouths. And if you op- and if you approach it with that level of gravity, then, you know, uh, you're going to be in a lot better, you're going to be in a lot better position, I think, to, um, you know, make sure everybody's very well prepared for stuff. Tip number three, if the discomfort is there, um, you, you, uh, and, and you just can't get around it, you know, um, Hey, I don't like the way I, I look in this video. I don't like to do these things. I don't like the spotlight being on me. I'm a very humble guy. I don't really like this, blah, blah, blah. Then, then find an alternate alternative spokes, you know, find alternative spokespeople that can help, um, deliver the message and do that with the CEO and say, okay, you're not comfortable. Why don't you help me find somebody that we can, you know, bring in that is going to be comfortable that we can, we can, you know, we can add to their duties <laughs> and we can add to their duties to, you know, to be able to do this. Now, here's the trick. Um, you know, uh, the media won't always take your alternative spokesperson. If you, you know, have John Stamos and that's your spokesperson, your celebrity spokesperson and that kind of thing, they may say, Hey, I want to talk company vision. And I don't give a, I don't want to talk to John Stamos. You know what I mean? It's like, I want to, I want to, where's the CEO? And then if you're ducking those calls a lot and they start to figure that out, then the story might be, why doesn't the CEO want to talk to us? What's he hiding? What's he or she hiding? You know, what, 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 what's going on here? You know, that kind of thing. And you certainly don't want that. So, um, I I would just, you know, be careful if you're going to do an alternative spokesperson, then you need to be able to kind of explain why, explain why and, and have a good, you know, um, 
discussion with all your journalist friends about why. It's important. Tip number four, keep your spokesperson well informed during the various steps. Um, there are a lot of steps that go on to, you know, to creating an interview. Some uh, interviews are just email. You know, are we going to get a fact check back? Are, we, are they going to do a, a quick fact check or, or will it just appear? You know, is this going to be a live? If it's going to be like a live, you know, radio interview or podcast, that kind of thing. We're probably not going to get to send questions in advance. So what are the potential questions that are going to be asked? And then, of course, we've gone over, we've done media training, right? And so we we know how to get people to bridge answers back to things. So, um, and there's nothing wrong with bridging answers, by the way. That's not like a politician BS trick. What it is is... You're there to tell. You're there to tell your story. The reporter's there to, to um, you know, uh, ask their questions. But you're there to make sh- make make damn well sure that your your story is getting told and your piece is getting told. And and you just want to find ways that you can um, that you can do that bridging while helping the reporter accomplish their objective of getting their story told. You know, so we could do a longer thing on you know bridging techniques and, and those kind of things. But you're you're. Senior level communications people should be absolutely making sure that the spokespeople are well informed during various steps. And I've seen spokespeople that are like, I don't really know what, where we are in this process. I don't really understand. And that can lead to more stress of how to do it. You know, hey, I don't know where we're supposed to be or, or we're doing a CNN interview, but we're going to do it, you know, via satellite from their local office or whatever. Well, then, you know. What does that look like? You know, I mean, really, really walk through and really communicate about this stuff and don't get so busy, uh, you know, doing other parts of the job that you that you miss that, especially with spokespeople that are, you know, um, not as comfortable with it. And the fifth tip is, you know, try to have some fun in this in the spotlight, you know. Uh, I always communicate to CEOs, no one starts a great company with a great mission in order to keep it a secret and have their friends and family go, well, that was a great, that was a great company. I re, you know, you guys did, did, we did such a good job. What, what a wonderful thing. They start a great company to change the world. They, and to change the world, you're going to have to tell the world. And, you know, uh, the and the truth is that, you know, if you're going to be a visionary person and you're going to have a story that's worth telling, then you know, have fun telling it, you know, that, that is, that's the fun part. And I think that, um, I always try to kind of at least focus there, you know, it helps, uh, you know, on stage, you can either be fearful or excited about having a solo. And if you choose to be excited about sharing what you got going on, then you're not going to be scared. It's hard to feel those two things at the same time. So what have we learned today? The media spotlight can burn pretty brightly for some people, but, you know, we have a job to make sure our clients, companies, and brands succeed. So that's exactly what we need to do. With the right preparation and expectations, senior executives can become more comfortable doing what they pay all of us to do. And because it's our job to make the and make sure the experience works for them. If we do that, we're going to have more opportunities down the line to help them shine. That's it for me, marketing fans, until, uh, actually we're off next week, but until the week after next, this has been Scott Robertson, host of May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media. Rock on, have a good one, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to TimDolbear.com and check out our free one-song mix offer. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, 
shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie's Groove.com. Ready to get your groove on?